All right, we're going to take this call. Call you live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, this is Malcolm Stein from Irvine. Okay, the reason I'm calling you, according to the Torah, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Is he supposed to be born in Bethlehem? And I know that Christians make a big deal about Jesus going to being a Nazarene, and, and some say he was born in Bethlehem. Does the Jewish Torah say where the Messiah is supposed to be born, or is that made up as well? Thank you very much. Um, so as it turns out, there is no passage anywhere in the Jewish scriptures that says that the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Now, if the Christian Bible, and I'm really speaking about the Gospel of Matthew, if the Gospel of Matthew had just made it up, as you say, I'm borrowing your term, that wouldn't be so bad. But the author of the first Gospel goes much further. There is a passage in the book of Micah, his name, Micha. He lived right here in Jerusalem. He wrote within, probably within a 20-minute walk from where I am right now. So Micha does identify Beis Lechem as the place from which King David came from, and his descendant will be, in fact, a ruler, will be the Mashiach. Here's how it goes. It's very simple. If you read Micah chapter 5, verse 1, in a Jewish Bible, and this is just a caution, in a Christian Bible, this passage appears as Micah 5, verse 2. It's the same verse. If you read that verse in its entirety, then you would not think the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. However, whoever wrote the the Gospel of Matthew wants you to think that it was a fulfillment of Scripture that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And therefore, the author of the book of Matthew does what is unthinkable, and that is he literally surgically removes the last part of this passage and replaces it with something brand new so you don't realize that the passage is referring to David, King David, rather than Jesus. So let's now, now that you got that, let's dial it back very quickly. We are told virtually nothing from the earliest writings in the Christian Bible. The oldest surviving canonical texts are the letters of Paul. There's no effort in any of the letters to tell us not only what city was Jesus born from, born of a virgin, or anything about his ministry, there's nothing. Apparently, Paul can spend all this time in Jerusalem, all this time with Peter, as we're told in Galatians 1 and 2, and apparently none of that, he thought none of the information he gathered on these uh, supposed travels gave him any information whatsoever to include in any of his letters, but it's not there. The earliest gospel did not think Jesus' conception uh, to a virgin, his miraculous conception was worthy of mentioning because he didn't know anything about it. But the idea that Jesus was was born to a virgin, was conceived in the womb of a virgin, you will only find in Matthew and Luke. And whereas Luke will simply tell you the story in his infancy narrative, Matthew will do what Luke almost never does and says, this is not an arbitrary event, but this is a fulfillment of a scripture. That in fact, Matthew does this very notably 11 times. There were 11 fulfillment citations of the book of Matthew, and there's really nothing else. There's no other book in the New Testament that writes quite like that. And this is going to get Matthew in a lot of trouble because we're looking at this text and going, what? Let's now go to the passage in question. The passage is in Micah 5, 1, again in a Christian Bible, it's 5-2, V'ata beis lechem efrosa tsar li yois be'alfi Yehuda, that you, Bethlehem, should have been the least of the clans in Yehuda. However, mimcha li yetze li yes Moshe b'Yisrael, and from you will go forth a ruler in Israel. If you stop right there, it sounds like a ruler in Israel, that is the Messiah, 
and he comes from Bethlehem. So if you stop there, bang, and you add nothing else, you will think correctly that Micah, who lived about 2,700 years ago during the Assyrian Empire, roughly seven centuries before the advent of Christianity, you would think that that passage correctly it predicts that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Except there is part B, which means the ending of the passage. Umaytsaisav, and is going forth, going out. And what's the connection between the ruler and Beis Lechem? It's not that the ruler is supposed to come from Beis Lechem, but rather Umaytsaisav mikedem me'olam. That his origins is not that he himself was born in Bethlehem, but it's mikedem, which means from early days, kaidem, which means from an earlier time, mimei oilam, from ancient days. Now, now who, who was born in Bethlehem? So this we know very well. A very famous person is born in Bethlehem, and that is King David. David HaMelech, see 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 58. David Amelch, King David, was born in Beis Lechem, and Matthew and Luke independently wanted to have Jesus born in Bethlehem. And I say it's independent because the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke are violently di different, and they are completely contradictory. In fact, they, they are far more contradictory than the passion narratives. Now, there are only four chapters in all of the Gospels that are infancy narratives. There are 89 chapters in the Gospels, of which four of them are infancy narratives, two from Matthew, two from Luke. Luke does not mention any passage associated, does not quote, he doesn't think this is important enough to mention. But Matthew does, but what he does is astounding. Remember, Matthew cannot leave in the ending of Micah chapter 5, verse 1 or verse 2, depending on which Bible you're using. He can't leave that ending in because the ending identifies un unambiguously the relationship between the city of Bethlehem and the Messiah. And that is, it's from ancient days. It's not that the Messiah is from Bethlehem, but it's really mikedem. It's from earlier days, mimei olam. And these terms, kedem, mimei olam, these kinds of phrases are always referring to the old days, the ancient times, a much more earlier time in Jewish history. Now, Ask yourself a question. Could the author of Matthew leave in those last four Hebrew words? The answer is no. Those four words, the last four Hebrew words of Micah chapter 5, verse 1, are a disaster for the author of the book of Matthew. Because that tells us that the Messiah is, is not the one who's supposed to be born in Bethlehem, but rather it's his ancestor from earlier days. Well, how do you deal with something like that? It's not a problem. What Matthew does is he takes out a, a scalpel, he takes out a nice sharp razor, and he cuts it out. If you go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, you will see that the author literally cuts out the ending. The text says, of you will come a ruler. But instead of saying, and his origins are from earlier days, from ancient times, instead of any, that is removed, it's exercised, it's, it, it is completely eradicated. And in its place, Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Who will be a shepherd of my people Israel? It's unbelievable. He literally cut and then pasted in. You understand what he did? He took out the offensive part. It's, it's mind-blowing. He took out the part that is that does not sustain his story. His story, the, quickly, the larger picture is that Magi, non-Jews from the east, presumably from Persia, are coming, following a star, coming to Jerusalem and stop off at the palace of Herod the Great. And they inquire, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? So they're following the star, and they get to, to Herod's palace and the 
leaders of the Jews say, ah, based on this passage, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And then the star starts moving like a GPS system. The star moves in. They apparently can follow the star, whatever. And the star lands right on top of Jesus' house. And that's where they go in and they bring their gifts. They bring three gifts. That's why people think they're actually three Magi, even though the text doesn't give us a number. So that's the story. And they adore him and kind of worship him. And the key is that what Matthew was setting up there is that the Gentiles are worshiping and adoring the child, the Savior, and Herod, is the king of the Jews, is looking to kill the kid and wipes out all the kids out of, out of, uh, out of Bethlehem, kills every child that's two years old and younger, which has never happened. But you see what's happening there. So the answer is that nowhere in Tanakh does it say the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Micah does tell us that there is a relationship, a connection between Bethlehem and the Messiah. And that is the Messiah's origins, meaning his Elta Elta Zayd, his great, great, his Sabarabo, his great grandfather, he is the one who comes from Beis Lechem, and he and it's connected. Matthew has to delete the ending of Micah chapter five verse one. Put in insert he'll be a shepherd over Israel, borrowing from Micah chapter five, but just two verses later, cutting out the middle and inserting this in its stead. Borrowing from the shepherd that you'll find in the book of Ezekiel, just slice, just paste that in there. And I'm going to say this to you: I have we have a many. Christian or former Christian viewers. And I'm going to just say this because I know there's an implied question, like, why don't Christians notice this? And the answer is they don't. And I'm sorry by answering, by repeating, sort of repeating it. The strange thing is that when you speak to Christians, they can't believe you and actually need to open up their King James and just look at both and go, well, how come I've been a Christian for 40 years and I never noticed that? So you got to do it. They don't look it up. They just don't look it up, or, and they don't, certainly are not looking at the Hebrew, and that's how they get themselves in a lot of trouble. As an addendum, John is not interested in Jesus' birth. He's not interested in even mentioning Mary by name because John has a much higher Christology. Not only is Mary not mentioned by name, but John doesn't even want to think about Bethlehem because Jesus is now from the eternal past, a logos from, from eternity. So... Strangely, in the book of John, John eradicates the whole idea by having somebody from the audience posing a question, but isn't the Messiah supposed to be born in Bethlehem in John 7.42? And it just goes unanswered. And John's just letting that go. Very strange. The key is go back to the original text. You go back to the original passage in Tanakh, you will see how the New Testament authors willingly alter them in order to make it appear Christological and please God, do tshuva, and that will trigger the coming of Mashiach. Great question. You mentioned the thing about the star, too, and I've always wondered why why would they even think that doesn't even make sense. I mean, how can you follow a star? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't tell, you couldn't look at even the North Star tonight and find out where it's at, where what even city it's in, much less whose house it's over. In the ancient world, this was a big deal, and we find these in other idea in other mythologies. But you're right. That means if you look at the sky and and you ask yourself at night on a cl clear night without a lot of light pollution and ask yourself, you know, which house is a star above, you would have, I would think, a little bit of trouble trying to identify which house a star is above. The big problem is what people don't see. So that's obvious, whatever. So it was some sort of star. I mean, whatever. You could, but the question is, if the star, here's the point which I think viewers will not get, maybe, and that is, if the star it means all, all they find out is where is the Messiah supposed to be born, and and the Magi are told Bethlehem. The star then takes off and goes to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a city in Judea, just right south of Jerusalem, really close. I can walk there. So how does the star know where to go in Bethlehem? It doesn't say like go to. 84th Street and Broadway in Bethlehem, there's no indication. So if the star knows where the house of Jesus is, because in Matthew's 
story. There's no inn, there's no manger, because it's a reverse story of Luke. Then why does a star suddenly become a genius, become Christopher Columbus, and suddenly can know the house? That means what, if the star knows to get to Matthew's palace— it has, and then even a better trick, the star knows exactly GPS takes him right to the house of Jesus, which that information was not given in Herod's palace. How does the star know? And the key is this is all a setup, and it's a setup to, to contrast the not just reckless, that's not enough, the, 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 the villainous behavior of the Jews— and contrast that with the innocent, um, beautiful approach of the Gentiles, that when the non-Jews discovered the Messiah, baby, Savior, they worship the child and bring gifts, whereas Herod is coming with the sword to kill all the children born in Bethlehem. And, I mean, that's the contrast. It's the same contrast you find in Matthew 27 with, with Pontius Pilate and his wife seeing Jesus innocent and the horde of Jews is screaming, crucify him. We take his blood upon us and our children. Matthew 27, verse 25. That verse in Matthew 27, 25 cost us a lot. I mean, if Gentiles want to know why Jews have to have a lot of money, it's because because your New Testament costs us so much. We have to pay such a high price for the drivel, for the anti-Semitism that's contained in your passion narratives. End of story. 